morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming, particularly those from Biomagune. This time is uh, Biomagune who, who, who joins Biogune for this uh, Christmas lecture. Uh, this is, uh, Manuel and I, we were just counting, this we think is the fifth Christmas lecture, so it's uh, getting really a tradition. Um, so, well, uh, uh, the, our speaker today is uh, Luis Leith Marzán, who and will be presented by Manuel Martin Lomas. <laughs> he has always been like that, you see. Okay, good morning, good morning, everybody. Today, uh, it is my, my privilege to chair this uh, scientific uh, session and to introduce the, the uh, Christmas lecture speaker, who is uh, Luis Liz Marzam, that presently he is the, the head of the Bio Nanoplasmonics Laboratory in, uh, in Bio Magune. Probably most of you already know that he, he joined us in the beginning of September, and uh, he is the person that, uh, in, in the very short time, a few days, will replace me as scientific director of, of Bio Magune. So uh, this is, to some extent, at least as far as Luis um, and I are concerned, this is a very special Christmas lecture. So I will say very few words about Luis. Luis is an outstanding and uh, highly recognized uh, physical chemist who uh, is an international leader in the field of metallic plasmonic metallic nanoparticles. So in this, in this area, he has already made important contributions uh, in the synthesis and surface modification of these uh, plasmodic nanoparticles in the um, characterization and modeling of the optical properties of these uh, nanoparticles, the assembly of these nanoparticles, and also in the, in the design and the development of uh, nanoparticle-based devices for ultra-sensitive uh, biosensing. So, uh, his work has been already uh, well recognized in spite of being a still young person. So he has a, quite a number of prizes and awards. So this includes, for instance, the, the uh, Physical Chemistry Award of the Royal, uh, Spanish Royal Society of Chemistry, the DuPont Science Award, the Budignola Award, he is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. He is a fellow of the Optical Society of America. He has already also received the ASCS uh, Nano Lecture Award, the Langmuir Award, and many other awards. I, I, I don't remember this time. Luis, uh, for those who, who like bibliometrics, Luis is author or co-author of our, around 270 publications at this point in time, with uh, more than 14,000 uh, citations by other authors. His uh, age index is 65. Maybe it's a little bit more because uh, it changes every time I have to, to introduce him to the audience. So. In this case, it's, I mean, last month was 65. And uh, he, his name is included in the, for some time, has been included, is still included in the um, uh, essential, uh, how do you this, The essential, the database? Science the, 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 the essential science indicator database. So Luis and um, I, we have been working together quite closely, I have to say, during the last uh, four months. And today, uh, I have not any doubt that, that Luis uh, will be an excellent director for Bio Magune. 
and that will, of course, uh, give international visibility to the center and will greatly contribute to increase the scientific out 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 output of Rio Magone. So this is all I have to say on Luis, and now we all look forward to listen to your lecture. Can you hear me? I'm going to speak from here because I feel closer to the audience. Um, so let me start thanking Manuel and Jose Maria, first of all, for the introduction, but especially for having given me the opportunity to come and join the venture of Biogune and Biomagune and belong to this family. I think that this is an excellent opportunity to get introduced to the Biogune community. I already have given a lecture to Biomagune. I tried to make this one a little bit different uh, in the sense that it will contain a part which is a little bit more philosophical, introducing the fields, uh, and then I will slowly try to go into the details of the research that we are doing now in Biomagune and have been doing before at the uh, University of Vigo. So the title actually has bound a little bit the scope of the lecture. Uh, initially I thought that I would give a purely scientific lecture, but uh, then I have decided to leave these smart composite uh, materials uh, for the end of the lecture, so I, I hope you will forgive this change. So I will start by by focusing a little bit uh, the activities that we do at Biomagune. So uh, this is a slide that Manuel prepared for the official presentations of the center. And it clearly says that we have to do scientific research. Let's forget uh, for a moment about technological innovation. And we have to work with materials. So then I remember that I had some other slides which I use when I talk to a less scientific audience, something like this, uh, where I remind them that uh, the use of materials has a very long history, but until very recently, this was all based on taking raw materials from nature and processing them. It's only about 100 years ago that we started to have industry, industry related to materials based on scientific research and specifically device development of new materials. So this is the field where we have to work. Now to do scientific research, we need funding. And I think that is especially at this time, it's important to remember that governments are supposed to support the basic research and scientific research in general. The reasons may take, be taken by here. So for example, if we have scientific research in a broad sense uh, in the field of materials, then this will allow to identify a large variety of new materials. In general, only very few of these will be eventually useful. And those that are identi identified as useful will go into industry. So industry will have new products that can be sold. And this will lead to the creation of new jobs. And both the companies and the employees will pay tax. And this way, they will give back the investment to the central government or whatever government. So please keep this in mind. It's, uh, it's very important to keep up with the activity in developing new materials or new knowledge so that we can have a further social development. Now, I also tell, especially when I give lectures to, to kids, I always uh, tell them or try to tell them who the scientists are. And this I have taken from a lecture from Musi Landman, who is a, a, a very talented scientist from Georgia Tech, who says, scientists are not those who always provide the correct answers, but those who ask the right questions. So this is again another, another important idea that we, we need to know which are the questions that have to be resolved so that we can advance in the knowledge and in the development of new wealth. 
So in the context of the research that we do, if we go a little bit back in time, answering a question was the official start of what is called nanotechnology. So uh, everybody says that the, the start of the area of nanotechnology is 1959. Uh, here is written 1960, but it was actually December 1959 that Richard Feynman gave a lecture entitled There is Plenty of Room at the Bottom. You can read the whole lecture at this web page. And the main point in this lecture was this question. Why cannot we write the entire 24 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica on the head of a pin? So Feynman was trying to discuss why people or why scientists were studying either the quantum field or the bulk materials field, but nobody was focusing on the intermediate scale, which is corresponding to the nanometer scale. And already at that, uh, at that lecture, he actually gave the tips on how, by using an electron microscope, which was already available at, at that time, it would be possible to do this. So this somehow made uh, um, policymakers change their mind, and scientists also change a little bit the way of working. And going into this intermediate scale, which was largely unexplored. Okay, so we are in the nanotechnology. I, I'm not sure how familiar you are. I'm, I'm sure that all of you have heard of this uh, and probably this movie is not needed. Let me skip the first part. How many of you have seen this movie? Nobody, good. Well, just one, okay. Okay, I'm supposed to get rid of this. So this is, uh, this is a movie that was made to exemplify the dimensions of the universe. Uh, so it goes from the scale of a picnic, and so it goes from the traditional length scale of a human body, about one meter, and then it goes up and goes away from the people having the picnic. But I will skip the first part and go directly to where we are already at the galaxies. Okay. And then we are going to, to go to scale down and uh, every square you see is one order of magnitude less. This is why it's called powers of 10. So now we are going all the way from the universe scale uh, back to the scales that we know more closely. So you see that if you go to the universe, you have to scale a lot to get down back to the scales we're used to. Uh, when, uh, please look when we get to 10 to the 9th. Uh, when we get to 10 to the 9th, we start to see the solar system, or the, the Earth, sorry. So basically, if you think reverse, going to the nanoscale means the same distance as going from the whole Earth down to an um, apple or so. Okay, so now we are back at the one meter scale, and now we start to, to zoom in into the head of this man, the hand of this man. So when we go to 10 to minus one, we have a centimeter there, uh, a decimeter, this is a centimeter coming up, millimeter coming up, and these are still the scales we are used to. And then quickly we will get into the smaller biological objects. So we start to see the pores of the skin. And then soon the red blood cells will come. Okay, so this goes a bit slowly. So the main idea is keeping in mind what going down in one power of 10 means. Okay, so we start to see the tissues and then these groups of cells, and then we go uh, directly into the cell, the cell membrane, and then we, uh, we see groups of fibers. You know a lot better than I do. So these are bundles of uh, DNA molecules probably, and we have to go quite far in until we reach the 10 to minus nine, which defines the nanometer scale. So 10 to minus nine is more or less the dimension of the diameter of a DNA molecule, okay? And this is the range of dimensions where Feynman was predicting that we would find different properties in all materials. 
So if we go below 10 to the 9th, then we start to see the atoms moving around. OK, so this is a summary. And, uh, and I don't think I have to go into the de detail of this, because you have all seen this before. So let's move on into how much this has been supported so far. And actually, already around 2000, uh, the, in the United States, they started with the National Nanotechnology Initiative. There was quite a bit of money uh, to be distributed among the groups. Uh, then Europe also started a little bit later, but not very late. In Spain, we had one call on a strategic action of nanoscience and nanotechnology. And then uh, it was decided that this would go into the normal calls, and there would be nothing special about nanotechnology in principle. Uh, I yesterday I found this plot, uh, which plots the cumulative amount that has been invested on nanotechnology so far. So we are here. Uh, so it's almost uh, we are here, close to 80 billion US dollars. And it's uh, expected that over the next three years it will still increase by 25%. Uh, there are also. Uh, predictions that the market will increase a lot and will reach 1 trillion by 2015. I'm not sure how old this prediction is, so 2006, okay. I, I didn't find the predictions of nowadays. I'm afraid it's not so optimistic as this one, but it's still expected to be very big. So this is the reason that why we still need to invest and do a lot more research in this field. OK, uh, this is also something which uh, you, most of you are familiar with, but I wanted to show it because I, I still think it's very nice. It's important to remember, for example, that uh, Ruska and Knoll invented the electron microscope around 1930 or so. And they did not receive, so I think it was only Ruska who received the Nobel Prize in 1986 because Knoll had passed away. So it was by the era of nanotechnology that it was recognized that electron microscopy was very important. And only when the Nobel Prize was given to the inventors of the scanning tunneling microscope, it was also given to the inventors of the electron microscope. OK, so if you want to watch nanomaterials in an electron microscope, you have to use one of these uh, copper grids, which are divided in very tiny holes where you have a caramel film. And then you deposit your nanoparticles there, and you start zooming in. You have to play with the magnets that are uh, those which are generating the images, um, the magnified images in the electron microscope. And then eventually, when you go very far into the detail, you start to see tiny dots. And these are the nanoparticles. In this case, these are cadmium selenide nanocrystals. And as you know, with electron microscopy nowadays, you can go and zoom in such a detail that you can actually distinguish the columns of atoms in each of the nanocrystals. In fact, this has progressed so far that last year it was published the first pictures where people could identify every atom in a nanocrystal. So this is a work by the group of Antendelo in Antwerp. They published this last year in Nature. We are collaborating with them now, and we are receiving many of the images like this, where they can actually see perfectly the three-dimensional morphology, even with atomic resolution of some of the nanoparticles that we can make. Why is this important? This is important because in nanotechnology, the main concept is that the properties of the materials change with the size and the morphology of the, of the material itself. So if we are not able to know in detail the morphology of the material, we cannot understand the correlation between the morphology and the properties of the material. OK, so now I'll go uh, into a specific type of nanomaterial, which are nanometals. As Manuel indicated, this is my field of expertise. And uh, I will focus mainly on the optical properties of nanometals. So, Application and different properties of nanometals is very old. Uh, these are pictures of materials that contain nanometals. This is a very famous cup that uh, was constructed by the Romans in the fourth century. Uh, it's still on display at the British Museum, so you can go there and, and have a look at it. Uh, it's on a shelf with a lamp behind it, which is switched on and off intermittently 
When it's off, you see a greenish color. When it's on, you see a red color. And this is coming from the colors from glass, which is making this vessel. If you take a little piece of the glass and put it in one of these grids, and you take it to the electron microscope, you find many of these tiny particles, which are made of gold and silver. So it's the, the composition, the morphology, and the size, and the concentration of the particles that lead to this color display in this really old cup. Again, this was exploited very often uh, in the Middle Ages for making, for example, stained glasses in old churches. So the reason why we still see colors in these stained glasses is that the, the, the dyes are actually inorganic pigments. And the reason that we can only see the colors from the inside of the church and not from the outside is that the pigments are so small, uh, nanometer scale, so that they can absorb a lot of light, but they cannot scatter much. So you don't see the reflected colors. Okay, so these are nanoparticles contained in the glasses and providing these, these really nice colors. Not all of them are metallic particles, but they are all particles of very small size that have specific absorption and, and provide this color. Okay, the first scientific uh, report regarding the optical, the special optical properties of small metallic particles was published in 1857 by Michael Faraday in a really nice paper called in, in Experimental Relations of Gold and Other Metals to Light, where Faraday described his work in the laboratory for about one or two years, where he was trying to understand what happens when the dimensions of metals get very small. So he studied both uh, thin metallic films and he was also making some uh, metallic colloids. So he was beating small metallic leaves with a hammer or something similar. And he was watching at the transmitted and re the reflected colors by these this, uh, uh, steadily thinner films. And he was doing chemical reactions in solution to make particles of different sizes. So he did not have the means to see the size of the particles that he was making, but he was guessing from the type of chemistry that he was doing and the type of response that he was seeing. Something in between these red colors that you see here, these are pictures from the uh, college that Faraday made, which are still at the Faraday Museum. Uh, so looking from, ranging from this red color here all the way to sort of gold looking uh, uh, liquid, he was seeing all these colors, and in the films, he could also see that when he was beating far enough, apart from the golden reflection, he could also see some bluish transmission. So if you do a spectroscopy that we can do now, you see that the gold film in transmission would look like this, with a small dip here at 2.5 electron volt, which corresponds to the blue color that we see in the transmission. And the spectrum of the colloid, is the same in the UV at high energies, but it's very different in the visible and in the infrared. And this is why here we have this type of particles which are perfectly crystalline, and actually the crystalline lattice is exactly the same as that for bulk gold, but the optical response is completely different. Okay, now the reason for these optical effects comes from the effect called plasmon resonances. So this is something that we have in metals. You can come with a specific uh, electromagnetic wave of a specific frequency, and you can excite the formation of charge density waves in the metal. And this is specific for each metal, and each metal uh, has a specific plasma wavelength. If you have a very thin film of a thickness of a few nanometers, then these waves cannot travel inside of the metal, so they are confined at the interface. And then we have the so-called surface plasmons, and the resonance condition is called surface plasmon resonance. Probably mo many of you have used the surface plasmon resonance biosensor, which is based on exactly this phenomenon, uh, except that in that case you have a bioreceptor which is anchored to the surface, and then when the specific molecule comes and binds to the receptor, it changes the resonance condition, and this is why you can identify the attachment of this molecule. 
You can do the same thing for small particles, but in that case, the waves cannot propagate in the same way, and then they have what we call the localized surface plasma resonances. So here what you have in very tiny particles is that you form a dipole, and then there is an oscillation of the charges of the dipole in resonance with the wavelength or the frequency of the light that is shining on it. So this is what defines these nice colors that I was showing you before. So for gold, you see that the, uh, the main absorption is around 520 nanometers for spherical small particles. For silver, the absorption is, well, depending on the conditions, around 400 nanometers. And this is why colloidal silver is yellow, colloidal gold is red. Uh, this is what we used to say until about 10 years ago, that we started to be able to make routinely nanoparticles with different morphologies, and then we cannot say anymore that colloidal gold is red or colloidal silver is yellow, because this changes a lot with the morphology of the particles. Another interesting phenomenon that takes place when this happens is that you also excite a very large electric field at the surface, in the near field of the metallic surface. So apart from creating this large absorption, you also create a high electric field, and this can be used to affect chemistry taking place in the neighborhood of this metallic surface. So this is the basis of all that we do in the, in the nanoplasmonics field. Let me give you also a brief historical note uh, about the prediction of near-field optics. So this comes from the well-known uh, uh, diffraction limit for the resolution of optical microscopy. So you all know that if you come with an optical microscope, depending on the numerical aperture of your objective, you can focus more or less the light, you have a more or, or a wider or narrower angle of vision, and even go into high angles, you can reach a maximum resolution of about a half of the wavelength of light, and this comes because of quantum chemistry and the uncertainty principle. So basically you can uh, convert the resolution equation into momentum, and then if you compare momentum with the, uh, with the dimension scale, you are limited by the uncertainty principle. So this cannot be overcome in principle, but uh, if you place a very tiny object that can focalize the field, like a sort of antenna, then you can actually get images where the resolution is defined by the size of the antenna. Okay? And this was already predicted by Edward Sinch in 1928. He was uh, trying to study optics and defining what the near field could be and how it could affect in practical devices. He actually wrote his discovery to Albert Einstein, who said, as far as this goes, I agree. However, your method of implementation appears to be fundamentally unusable to me. Uh, so when Saints read this, he thought about it, and still he said, the most important is probably to publish the idea itself in a scientific journal and indicate the difficulties of its execution. So this is another message that you can take. So if you have a really good idea and you're convinced that it is correct, I think it's still better that you publish it and let somebody else implement it. Anyway, so Singe was correct and people have now implemented the near field optical microscopy, for example. And this has all come about in a, in a new field of science which is called plasmonics or nanoplasmonics. And this actually, it's, it was thought to be a contradiction because we are talking about manipulating light with objects that are considerably smaller done the wavelength of light, and this was thought to be impossible. So in our particular case, in our laboratory, we are trying to combine this concept with colloid science, where if you look at the traditional definition, you also find that this is related to uh, objects that, are, that have sizes ranging between one nanometer and one micron. So we are basically at the same scale as it is usually defined for nanotechnology. And this was already defined already in the 1920s when Oswald wrote his less famous than he should book entitled The World of Neglected Dimensions. So this is again, if you, if you think about this title, it's not very different to the title of Feynman's talk. 
So it's also related to why we are not studying the colloidal range if we are finding phenomena that are completely different to what we see normally. So by playing with colloid chemistry, creating small objects in solution, we are able to fabricate a wide variety of compositions, shapes and sizes. This was mostly developed at the colloid chemistry group that I was leading at the University of Vigo and this we are continuing in Biomaguni at present. So the, all these pictures correspond to particles that we have made, basically made of gold or silver and trying to understand how by playing with the surface chemistry we can direct the growth of certain crystalline facets while others do not grow. And this is the only way to control the morphology of the materials. And we also analyzed the effect of all these morphological changes on the colors of the solutions of these particles. And then through theoretical methods, we could also understand and correlate the experimental observations with the theoretical predictions. OK. So now that we understand this, then we can try and go to participate in some of the applications that have been predicted for the nanoplasmonics field. And as you can see, people have predicted applications in a wide variety of fields, quite a bit on the biomedical era, area, but also in detection, fabrication of new types of lasers, in information recording, in the fabrication of materials with uh, completely different properties, like uh, the so-called metamaterials or materials with negative index of refraction, or even in the energy fields for improving the efficiency of solar cells, for example. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some applications in sensing or biosensing that we have carried out in our laboratory. And actually here I realized that uh, the design of the leaflet advertising this lecture was actually very appropriate because they chose something which contained many little stars. And this is our favorite system at, mom at the moment. So I wanted you to compare the nanostars from the advert with the nanostars that we make. Okay, so don't ask me why the particles grow like this. This we don't understand so far, but we know that they can be used for very interesting applications because they have very interesting properties. So for example, we determined that when you excite the plasma resonances in these type of particles, you can get a really high confinement of the electric field at the tip with intensities that are much higher, much higher than those that you obtain for spheres, for example. Uh, additionally, the absorption spectrum of the nanostars is completely different to the one that you get for spheres. And this is a comparison, again, of theory and experiment for both systems. So it makes sense. And we also know that if the field is concentrated so highly at the tips, it's actually much more sensitive to what happens in the neighborhood of the surface than what happens for spherical particles. So we have done quite a bit of work on exploiting the properties of gold nanostars. I'm going to show you one recent example uh, introducing the concept of inverse biosensing. This is a collaboration with Molly Stevens at Imperial College. And it's based on using this reaction where you can use an enzyme to actually promote the reduction of silver ions in the presence of uh, glucose oxidase. So it's basically when there is this enzymatic reaction, you, produ you, you, produce, uh, you promote the formation of hydrogen peroxide, which can get oxidized uh, to oxygen, and then it reduces silver plus to metallic silver. So if we do this reaction in the presence of our gold nanostars, we actually find that at very low concentrations of the glucose oxidase, we get a conformal coating of silver on the gold stars. If we do it at a higher concentration, we also get the formation of tiny silver particles in the solution. So most of the silver here is employed in forming these tiny particles, while here most of the silver is going onto the surface. OK, so then Molly came up with the idea, why don't we do this and try to sense something interesting? So we actually deposited some antibody on the surface of the nanostars, which is selective for prostate sp 
specific antigen. So in the presence of PSA, it should come and bind here. And then we attach another antibody, which contains glucose oxidase. And then in the presence of silver ions, if this reaction happens, the glucose oxidase should be here on the surface of the particles. Then the combination of the glucose oxidase with the catalysis from the nanostar would lead to the reduction of silver and the position on the surface of the metallic particles, like this. So what we find is that indeed, when we do the experiment with no analyte, nothing changes. If we do it for a high concentration of PSA, we get some shift of the plasma resonance band. But if we do it for a much lower concentration, we get a further shift. So this is a completely new way of thinking, because here, when you reduce the amount of the analyte, you increase the signal. So you, get, you can go to extremely low concentrations. 10 to minus 18 was the minimum we could detect. So as you see here, also in the presence of a non-specific antigen, you don't see any effect in the optical response. So only when the PSA is coming to bind to the initial antibody, and then the second antibody is also being attached, we can carry out the reaction, and the signal increases for lower concentrations of the analyte. The last part of the talk I wanted to talk about uh, Raman scattering because this is the technique that we are implementing more often now in the lab. So for those of you who, for, who for, forgot about basic spectroscopy, just a quick reminder. Uh, in chemistry courses, Raman scattering is typically explained uh, at the same time as infrared spectroscopy, basically because we are also looking at vibrational levels. So changes in the vibrational energy level in molecules. In infrared, you're radiating with the specific energy to promote these transitions. In Raman, you are promoting a transition to a forbidden state, and then you watch the electron go back to a different vibrational state, and then emit energy which corresponds to this difference here. Uh, you can, uh, the, the problem with Raman spectroscopy is that this process is extremely inefficient because the electron has to pass through a forbidden state. So only one in quite a few million processes you get this effect taking place. You can increase a little bit the efficiency by promoting the electrons first to the first excited electronic state and then watch them go back to a different vibrational state which is called resonance Raman but still the cross-section of these processes is very low for most of the molecules that we know. So in the 70s, Fleischmann, Martin Fleischmann, who passed away very recently, discovered by coincidence that when he was comparing the, spe the Raman spectrum of pyridine, either from the liquid state or when pyridine was deposited on a silver electrode, there were many orders of magnitude difference in the intensity of the Raman spectrum. Uh, initially, Fleischmann thought, and this is what is written in this paper, Fleischmann thought that this was because uh, these electrodes are typically quite rough, so if you let the molecules absorb on the surface, you may get many more absorption points than what you can think. But this can be easily calculated and it doesn't fit at all with the increase in the intensity of the signal that he was measuring experimentally. So then some other people came to explain, oops, I don't have this here, sorry. Uh, why don't I have this? Oh, it's here. Well, anyway, so I misplaced uh, a slide. Sorry about that. So these people here came and tried to explain that actually what happened is that when you're exciting the silver electrode, which is very rough indeed, you have many nanometer scale grains, so you're actually exciting surface plasma resonances in these grains, and then you're creating a high electric field, which affects the polarizability of the molecules, and this is why you get this high enhancement of the Raman signal. So you could it, uh, think of implementing this. You have your molecule, you attach it to the surface of a nanoparticle, and then you can get a specific fingerprint Raman scattering spectrum for this molecule, which gets highly enhanced because of this electric field that you're creating. So in theory, you could be, be able to get enhancement factors even of 12 orders of magnitude, which means that you can get the same information with a much lower amount of material. 
You can still even increase the enhancement by bringing particles together because then you form what is called hotspot, meaning that the plasmon of one particle and the plasmon of the, of the second particle overlap at the gap between them. And then you have a much higher field here in between, about a thousand times higher than usual. And then you get, get e even uh, better sensitivity than with single particles. Okay, so now I go back to this slide which describes the pros and cons of surface enhanced Raman scattering as an analytical technique. So the advantages are, first of all, it's highly selective because you can get a, a fingerprint which is specific of each molecule. It can be very sensitive. It has been demonstrated that with these orders of enhancement you can get down to single molecule detection. You can do it very fast. You can also use portable Raman spectrometers, so you can go to the field or to, this, to the hospital to do your experiments. You can even create encoded particles with these systems, which are much more stable than fluorescent molecules or quantum dots. And you can also, you also have a limited library because you can use many different molecules to provide the code for distinguishing one particle from another. And it can be applied basically to anything because every molecule has a Raman scattering spectrum. The problems that have uh, so far restricted the application of SERS are the reproducibility of the signals because normally you try to, to enhance the signal so much that you need to aggregate the particles. And if you are not careful enough, every aggregate will be different, so the enhancement will be different. And this also affects the, uni the uniformity of the substrates. And another important problem is that the analyte that you want to identify has to be very close to the surface of the particle. This is something that I probably did not stress enough. You can get this very high increase in the electric field. We can see it in this slide, actually. You can see this very high increase in the electric field, but it goes off very quickly when you go away from the surface. So only a few nanometers away from the surface, the molecule will not feel the high electric field, so you will not get the SERS effect. So this is a problem, especially when you want to identify molecules that cannot easily absorb on metallic surfaces. And this is why we have to define or to design materials that can capture the molecules that you want to identify. And this is what I want to show you. So this is one example where we created these SERS substrates by using carbon nanotubes as templates so we know the chemistry of this uh, type of materials quite well. We know that we can deposit polyelectrolytes on the surface of the carbon nanotubes, creating charges on the surface. And then we can absorb particles directly because of electrostatic interaction. So we can get this type of materials that, are, that can be suspended in water. And then we can, we can put them in contact with the uh, bio fluid that we want to analyze. So this is, where, this is the change in the, in the absorption or the uh, absorbance spectrum of individual uh, silver nanoparticles and the silver nanoparticles on the carbon nanotube. It becomes much broader because of this coupling of the plasmons, so you're creating new plasmons at the gaps between the particles. So you can see here we have many gaps and these are all places where the enhancement will be extremely high. So we decided to apply this to, uh, for a detector for cocaine consumption. So we went into the literature. We found that cocaine is metabolized in a few different types of molecules. One of the most abundant metabolites is this one, benzoylegonine. Uh, this molecule coincidentally has here a, a nitrogen that might be able to attach to the metallic particles. So we could try to do direct identification of this molecule. And we can indeed recognize the surface enhanced Raman scattering spectrum of benzoylegonine down to micromolar concentrations. But we decided to do a selective detection, which might actually help us to quantify the concentration of this analyte. So what we did was we found an antibody which is selective for benzoylegonine. We attached the antibody to the metallic nanoparticles on the carbon nanotube. We were able to identify the cell spectrum of the antibody alone. And then, in the presence of benzoylegonine, benzoylegonine comes and binds to a specific place of the antibody, and it changes some of the peaks that we found on the antibody alone. 
So it's the change in, the, in these peaks that, that tells us about the attachment of the molecule to the antibody. And lucky enough, actually this peak here, if you watch carefully, this peak remains constant. So we can use this peak as an internal standard and then comparing the ratio between the intensity of this peak, which gets dumped in the, so it gets increased in the presence of the, of the analyte, we can compare the intensities and we can plot a calibration curve to actually find out the concentration of the analyte in solution. Another nice example is the combination of metallic nanoparticles and polymers. I'll show you two examples and then I'm done. So the first example was a collaboration with Nick Kotov, uh, who coincidentally found in his lab that he could, he could use uh, pyrene as a template to grow branched gold nanoparticles. So these are some blobs of this uh, polymer. And then when he was growing the metallic particles there, he found these funny shapes which look like our nanostars, but they are not exactly the same because, first of all, the branches are not straight, which is a problem, and the tips are not sharp. However, the nice thing is that they have these very tiny gaps between the branches. So if you're able to bring molecules to these gaps, you may have also hot spots there, so you can also increase a lot the intensity of the Raman signal from the molecules. So what we did was to infiltrate certain molecules in the polymer, and we were even able to identify the spectra from single particles. So we labeled a substrate, we went with the confocal microscope, we identified the presence of the particles, we measured the Raman signal from one single particle, and then we went to the scanning electron microscope and identified which particle was providing the signal. But not only that, we could also see that if, for example, we incorporated pyrene into the polymer, which can diffuse in this uh, polyisoprene thing. We get this black spectrum here, which is the surge spectrum of pyrene. And then if we take the particles to a clean water solution, then the pyrene is actually diffusing out. And then we see how the signal goes down. So we can identify not only the incorporation of pyrene, we can also monitor the release of the molecule. So in principle, you could also think of capturing other types of molecules in a more selective manner and then carry them and identify how they are released in the, in the target system. And the final example is related to uh, the smart polymer system, which are these poly and, iso uh, and isopropyl acrylamide microgels. So these are made from this monomer and a cross-linker, and you need, of course, an initiator to promote the polymerization. So if you do this in, a, in appropriate conditions, you may be able to fabricate nice colloidal spheres, which have a really interesting behavior because uh, the composition of the polymer makes that at a certain temperature, there is a phase transition. And then you see a transition from an open, space, uh, open state to a collapsed state. So there is a big change in the dimensions of the particles above a certain temperature. You can also change the composition of the polymer with, for example, this acrylic acid group so that it's also sensitive to pH or to ionic strength. So you can fabricate and tune the composition of the polymer so that these transitions take place by either affecting with temperature or with pH in solution or with other external parameters. So what you see typically is something like this. This is the so-called uh, liquid critical solution temperature a lowest critical solution temperature. And you see this is a plot of the size of the particles versus temperature. You see that at around 32 degrees, there is a sharp transition, which tells you that the particles become much smaller. OK. So we decided to combine this with our metallic particles. And then we designed a process for coating the gold nanoparticles directly with the microgel. So we had to do first uh, some surface modification. And then from there, we could grow the shells of this smart polymer on the surface of the gold nanoparticles. We got these nice pictures showing the core shell structure. So the dark dot in the middle are the gold particles. And the lighter halo is the polymer. You see that the shape of the polymer is not perfectly uh, rounded. This is because this is, this is actually, a, so to say, a fluffy system, which when you dry it, it actually collapses on top of the metallic particle. And this is what you see here also in the AFM picture, where you see that the 
gold core protrudes out and the polymer is actually flattening around it. But in solution, we expect it to be something like this. A fully concentric system where by changing temperature it can ex be expanded or collapsed only in the shell and the core is of course not changing because it's made of gold. So we measure the changes in the size and we see the same thing as we're for the polymer alone. We can also check the changes in the maximum of the plasma resonance and we also see changes which are fully reversible and this is because we are also changing the refractive index around the particle when the polymer collapses on top. This is very similar to the surface plasma resonance biosensor. In that case, you're watching changes in the reflection conditions. Here, you're, you're watching changes in the absorption conditions, but it's all related to changing the refractive index close to the surface. Okay, so now we go and design the system in such a way that we let certain molecules diffuse through the pores of the shell and then bind to the gold core, and then we can measure the surface and Hans-Raman scattering spectrum of these molecules. And this was the easy example where the molecule has a thiol group. So if it can diffuse through the pores of the microgel, it will bind chemically to the gold, and then you can easily get the Raman spectra. So this is what you see here. Uh, in this case, regardless of temperature, you see the same intensity, uh, except if you start at high temperature, when the microgel is collapsed, the pores are very small, so it's very difficult for the molecules to diffuse in. And then if you lower temperature and let the pores expand, then you see again the increase in the signal exactly the same as if you started at low temperature. The nice thing was that when we used a molecule that did not contain any functional group that could attach to the metallic surface, what we saw was this. So at low temperature, we don't get any nice signal because the molecules are diffusing in, but they can also diffuse out. There is no reason for them to stay close enough to the metallic surface. If we increase the temperature, then the shell collapses and it traps the molecules close to the core, and then we get this increase in the signal, fully identification of naphthol. This is the first ever published uh, search spectrum of naphthol. And then if you lower the temperature again, the molecules diffuse out and you lose the signal again. So this is not, you, you can not only trap and identify the molecule, it's actually a reversible sen a sensor. Okay, so with this I finish. I think that the main message is that research is essential. I took this picture from the newspapers today. Uh, the second message is that you need to find relevant questions that will help to advance knowledge and, and also industry in the end. And then, more specifically, color chemistry is a natural alley of nanoplasmonics, and by combining both, we can design biosensing strategies and search platforms that can allow us to go into uh, different fields, but in particular to the biomedical field. Thank you very much for your attention, and Merry Christmas. I can. I don't know if everybody can. So, do I understand well that um, that high electric field on the surface of these nanoparticles is there when you shine light on them? So, it's associated with the plasma. Yes. So, could you use it to control crystal growth on the surface of these things? Because perhaps some macromolecules that have a, a dipole moment could order themselves on this, but then you could tune the effect by switching the light off. Yes, this has been, or something similar has been recent, recently reported uh, regarding light-induced polymerization. Um, yes, this is a little bit unexplored so far, uh, but I think that there is a lot of potential. There is a, so if, it depends a little bit how far you want to go. Uh, I have not shown very much of the plasmonic characterization of particles with different morphologies. But in fact, you can, uh, you can fabricate the particles in such a way that certain parts of the particles are a lot more active than others. For example, in the nanostars, 
you see that this electric field is focalized on the tip. Uh, at the middle part, there is basically nothing. So you could also foresee that you can do chemical reactions more specifically at the tips. Uh, indeed, we have found that for surface enhanced Raman scattering, if the molecule is at the tip, the enhancement is very large. If it's not, it's almost nothing. So yes, I think that this is an interesting area to go into. understand uh, completely in the case of the polymer yeah uh, when the molecules you, you mentioned that when the molecule uh, enter you have a selectivity where is the origin of the selectivity how no, how um, this polymer selected the, no, the different I molecules? think I think I didn't say too, so, so much I said we may think of ways to doing it in a selective way this was not selective uh, you, can, you can have a certain selectivity related to the hydrophobicity of the polymer and the molecule, but it's a very low selectivity. But you could also think of tuning the pore size in the polymer or having functional groups that can interact with certain molecules. So, yeah. But this was not the assignment. Uh, thank you, sir, for, for your talk. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you, did you, there is some application for those nanoparticles in the drug delivery, and how much, how deep they go inside the cells in order to make this kind of? Yes, uh, the first question is easy. There are many examples of drug delivery applications, and you can do it in a number of different ways. The one that might be more closely related to what I was speaking about would be to link your drug to the particle through uh, another mo an intermediate molecule in such a way that if you hit, you release your drug. So then you could come with a, with a light beam to the particle. Because of the plasmon resonance, you also get heating, and then you could induce the release of the drug. This is a way to do it. Uh, how far you can do that um, depends a bit on which particles you're using and, and how deep you want to go. Uh, you can make the particles in such a way that they absorb uh, near infrared light in the transparency window of tissue. Uh, I think that the reported deepest uh, um, uh, position is about five centimeters or something like that. Uh, how deep the particles go in the inside cells, uh, this also depends again of many, on many factors. It depends on the shape and the size of the particles, but also on the surface coating. Uh, I think that there is still a lot of work to do in that respect, to really be able to direct the particles to specific locations within inside the cell. Any other comment or question? No, thank you again. Thank you. Before we start with uh, this uh, uh, Christmas diploma, I just want to say a couple of words. Is, uh, I know Manuel knows that I, I don't say many things uh, in these occasions, but it ha has been a privilege having Manuel Martin Lomas. Uh, uh, has been a privilege for me working with him for these five or six years. Without him, not only half of you would not be here, but Bimagune not only would be very different, but the, the expectations for science in the Basque country would be poor. Uh, he, he's not living, in case any of you had any doubt. He stays as a scientist, he's always been a scientist, he will be working in Bimagune. His last contribution to the center and to science 
for this period has been the recruitment of Luis Luis Marzán. I think you can see the uh, the personality of a person, his capacity to give, by how he uh, passes the torch to the next person. He's not only been tremendously generous, but he has given a tremendous gift to Biomagune. So uh, I just finished by saying that I, I cannot be more helpful to, 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 to Manuel, and to thankful to Manuel. Thank you very much, Manuel. Go okay, with but this. I, I am not living. I am not living. <laughs> no, no, he's living. <laughs> he stays in the lab for the next no, years to come. Yes, maybe I, I, I say something. Okay, you say something. It's okay. I, I think. Uh, you see, I'm also I'm very happy that that I. Oh, it's working. Yes, I, I'm very very glad that I had the opportunity to contribute somehow to to establish Bio uh, Magune in in the last. Uh, almost seven, seven years. Uh, because this is the second time in my life in which I, I have been involved in, in starting a new research institute. But, but believe me that in this case, uh, it has been a very big challenge to me just to define the scientific project of, of uh, an institute that was focused in, in nanobiomaterials and in molecular imaging because, because uh, these uh, areas of research uh, are far from my own expertise and my own experience. So uh, at the beginning, and even now, I, I felt like a foreigner. And I must say that also uh, most of these people in the field, I mean, all these people doing colloid chemistry and doing nanoscience, they always consider me a foreigner in this field. <laughs> Nevertheless, Biomagune is there. And uh, I have to say that after seven years uh, of working in this area, I think that Biomagune is an unconventional research institute with a very high potentiality, I have to say. So I, I had the opportunity to, to widen, of course, my scientific vision, um, my scientific interest, which is a, a gift when you are over 65. I was 65, exactly, when I came here. So I consider myself a very, very lucky person uh, because of this, but Mainly because I had the opportunity, I had the opportunity to to uh, put into effect my own ideas and my own thoughts with the full support, not only economic but full support, and uh, without very little political or bureaucratic interference. And this is absolutely unusual. I have been all my life doing research and uh, in, in many, in several occasions, I have to take some uh, uh, director positions in, in, in several occasions and I never had a situation like that. So, so I am extremely grateful to, to uh, uh, Jose Maria who gets me aside from all these bureaucratic and political uh, problems that you always have, and to Alfonso Egaña that gets me free from any administrative uh, problem, but also to, to all the uh, group leaders and uh, platform managers and the maintenance people and the administration people and all these people that, that today constitute the big family of, of uh, of uh, Bio Magune. So I thank Semaria for, for uh, inviting me to come, and I thank uh, Luis for accepting my invitation to join. So thank you very much to everybody. <laughs> so
So now we continue with this. Uh, sorry, we, we get the diploma of this year. It, it will be as much confusion as every year. Yes. <laughs> so don't expect any improvement. Maybe, maybe when we both are away, things become better. Would we start with this? Yes, this, this, this year is, is even more difficult. Well, you, 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 you start. Because we didn't rehearse. And also because I think nobody from the Magoni is here, just to take this diploma. So, so uh, we have only two, two, uh, two uh, uh, people, two, two diploma this year. One is for, for uh, Gabriela Romero, who did the PhD thesis in the laboratory of Sergio Moya. Um, Gabriela is, is, as far as I know, is in the States. Is uh, already doing, doing uh, her postdoc starting the work. I don't know if, if oh yeah, you see somebody from the laboratory oh, of Sergio is coming. And uh, it is not here. <laughs> Uh, you tell your boss to sign when you see him. This is an impression. Uh, this is an impression. We think you can hear it. And then? And then? And then? And the second one is uh, Fabrizio, um, Fabrizio Chiodo, who, who uh, did the, the experimental work in the laboratory of Soledad. And uh, I was informed this morning that he is not here either today. So the, the diploma will be oh. received by Marco Marradi. Yes, uh, so, uh, and this, so the... the <laughs> so now, now we go with your goodness, see if, if we are lucky. The first one is Guillermo Abascal, uh, this PhD with, uh, in the laboratory of Aitor Yerro. Guillermo is here. <laughs> Benia Tanjar from uh, Lucy Malinina's lab, and she's here. David Fernandez Ramos uh, did his thesis uh, with Malu Martinez Cantarla. Lab, <coughs> see here. No, but you get good. Uh, well, okay, this is it. Uh, I just found out also that the, the signatures <coughs> are not in the right place. So maybe next year, I mean, they're all below, should be on top of the name. So maybe next year we are finally able to have the people, the signature well placed. <laughs> um, uh, well, anyway, thank you very much. And um, there is uh, 
a, a, a little, I mean, a cocktail or a little lunch, which uh, I hope this time you uh, will be less uh, uh, hungry than, than uh, two years ago. <laughs> <laughs>